Okay, yeah. So yeah, today I will talk a little bit about some fundamental aspects of quantum machine learning. Um, yeah, this talk will be a little bit technical, but I will try to do it. I mean, very smooth. My goal is to try to let you know which is the kind of research that right now is being done in like in quantum machine learning regarding like analytical calculations and which is the kind of questions that uh, are trying to be answered right now in in this field so i will just start with the content i will introduce the st statistical learning model which is how do we formalize the learning task this is not the, about quantum it's just the classical learning task where we have a learner, we have a task, and which is the goal of, of, uh, of such a learner. Then I will talk about inductive bias, which is also a classical machine learning concept, but I will relate this concept, how is this related with, with the quantum models that we usually design. Then I will introduce um, pack learning, uh, probably approximately correct learning. And then I will talk about one of the main topics right now or one of the yeah in, in regarding research in QML which is the generalization power of, of quantum machine learning models so I will start with the statistical learning model you will see there are a lot of mathematical expression not, not a lot but it's quite formal but I will try to um, explain uh, somehow in, in, a, in a smooth way so first of all, the, what we have is, is a learner, okay? And can you see my mouse? I guess so. You, yes. yes. No. Okay. So basically, the learner has a domain set, which is some uh, source of data, a label set. In our case, we will focus on binary classification, so the label can be zero or one, and then some training set, which is part of this domain set. Okay. So of all the data space you select some samples and these are the input uh, for, for the learner and the goal of the learner basically is to look for a prediction rule which is going to be a function which takes some uh, some data and outputs a label okay so these data points uh, are generated according to some probability distribution okay so when you program for example in python some machine learning algorithm you are sampling for for from some data source in general this uh, sampling is uh, uniformly random this distribution is random and is uniform but it can be a gaussian distribution of the data or whatever but there are some underlying probability distribution and you are sampling data from this distribution okay however the learner doesn't know about this distribution okay the learner can only access the training set. This is the only information that uh, the only information that the learner can get is by interacting with the with the training set. Okay. Then we have some correct labeling function. Okay, which basically, if you have some data point x and you apply this function, you will get the real label of the of the data. Okay. So basically, this function is what the learner aims to obtain okay and obviously this function is unknown and the the probability distribution is unknown by the learner so the learner can only access the training set so the error of the classifier formally is basically the probability of uh, if i find some prediction rule i apply to the data and is the probability of uh, of uh, not not factored in in the in the prediction okay so the f of x which is basically the true label to be different from our prediction and we are sampling the data from this probability distribution so as you can see here the error of the classifier which is also known as the true error or the risk of this is the what we want to minimize okay however we don't have access to this the learner has an access to this basically because he doesn't know this probability distribution and he doesn't know this f so the learner cannot construct this object, okay? So basically the learner, what can do is access to uh, what is called the empirical risk, which is the 
the training the training error okay so for example here we have an example this the empirical risk basically if you go through this um, formula so imagine that you have m training points this is why you are normalizing by this m so basically you look for a label uh, for y which belongs to this set uh, in such a way that uh, the prediction that you have is different from the actual label okay so this is how you compute the error which is the percentage of misclassified uh, points belonging to your training set quite easy in this way so imagine that we have this problem okay here i'm drawing the the decision boundary so the 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 points that are above this decision boundary or inside this decision boundary are labeled with one and outside are labeled with uh, a zero. So imagine that we have two learners. Okay, so our goal is to find some age function. This is the output of a classifier. So here we have two different uh, classifiers. One uh, is this one here, as you can see, uh, uh, if age of a point is, um, is of this color, it will, assign the label one, and if not, it will assign the label zero. So as you can see here, there, this classifier H1 is obtaining a um, training accuracy of zero, okay? It's classifying well uh, every point of the training set. However, for example, this other one is classifying well three out of the four points that we have. So basically we have a point which is misclassified and we have this uh, error of this H sub two, which is one fourth, okay? So there's one point misclassified out of the four, four points of the training set. Okay, so apparently you could say, okay, obviously this, um, the first predictor is better than the second one because we are uh, getting a zero training, uh, training loss. So basically the learning task formally is to find a predictor that minimize the, 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 the training error. And this is what is called the empirical risk minimization, okay? So as I mentioned you before, we don't have access to the true error. The learner doesn't have access to the true error. The learner only has access to this empirical risk. And the learner is gonna build a model trying to minimize the empirical risk, not the real risk, okay? However, as you can see here, we can assume, or we, at first sight, we will say that this learner is better, uh, this uh, hypothesis is better than the other one. However, this may be true, but maybe not. And why not? Basically, we, because we have this problem, which is overfitting. For example, we can construct this classifier, okay? So this classifier is, is quite simple. Uh, if I apply the classifier to a data point X, I will assign the label Y sub I. If I find some point of my training set, which is the same as the one that you are giving me, okay? And we'll assign the label zero otherwise. Okay, so very simple. Imagine this is my training set. I know that these two points are of class plus one and these two points are of class, belong to class zero. And then I get this point, okay? This point, then using this classifier, I go to my training, the, uh, training set and I see that this point is exactly this point. Then I can assign its label, okay? So I will say, okay, as this point is the point is this point of the training set and I know its label, I can guess that this label is gonna be plus one. That's nice. And this is what this classifier is doing. However, if now I get this other point, which is not in my training set, I will assign the label zero when, when uh, this should be labeled plus one because it's inside this region. So this classifier basically is taking individually each point is checking if whether this is in my training set and assigns basically the label of the point which is in the training set. And if not, it assigns basically the label zero, okay? So this is gonna get a, a training error equal to zero because if I work with this learner, with this um, classifier using only a, the training set, I will always be able to find the training point which belongs to, to the training set, and I will always be able to assign the current label. So this is basically classifying well individually each point of the training set, okay? It's a little bit abstract. However, the true error here, which is the one that we want to minimize, we 
want to build a classifier which is able to generalize and to get a low error uh, on unseen data points uh, is one half, which is basically a random guess. Okay, so using this classifier, which is working perfectly in the training in the training set, is unable to classify, and this is the the concept of overfitting uh, mathematically explained. Okay, so this this learner is unable to generalize. Basically, this is quite the conclusion here is quite trivial, but it's quite important, and I want to motivate this that we can not uh, focus only on the training uh, trainability of a model, we need to ensure that we are able to build a model which is able to generalize, okay? So now I move to a concept which is inductive bias and is crucial on machine learning in general, but in quantum machine learning especially. So without any restriction, the empirical risk minimization may lead to overfitting, okay? Because I will always be able to build a classifier like the other one, and if I'm not restricting my search space, my optimizer will always look for a, um, a classifier that will overfit the data and will just get 100% accuracy over the training set. So the solution is to restrict the search space, okay? I will not allow uh, my algorithm to look for any, any hypothesis, I will just restrict the space, so I, I, I beforehand I select an hypothesis class. This is a set of functions, okay? And what I will do is I will look for the optimal uh, function inside this hypothesis class, okay? Now I don't allow my algorithm to look for any function. This function needs to be inside the hypothesis class. In practice, when you select a, a machine learning model, for example, I select a neural network of four layers, here you are restricting the kind of functions that you that you have. And then by optimizing the parameters, you are selecting this uh, small age, okay? So by selecting the machine learning model, you are restricting the hypothesis class. You are just focusing on some kind of family of function, which is this capital H. And by optimizing the model, you look for the optimal function, which belongs to this uh, function class, okay? so. I have the guarantee, and this can be proven analytically, that if this set of functions is finite, I mean, is a, a, a specific number of functions, this empirical risk minimization over this constraint will not overfit, okay? I will not find any of those uh, classifiers that will give me 100% training accuracy and random guess uh, in, the test, uh, in the test set, okay? So ideally, the restriction of the hypothesis class uh, will be based on some previous knowledge about the problem. For example, I know the task that the task that I need to tackle, and I know that this kind of convolutional neural network will perform well because of some previous knowledge. Okay, and this is what is called inductive bias. So I know that I need to restrict my search space of functions, and I know something about the problem, so I take advantage of this knowledge to restrict the models that I will uh, that I will uh, use and the models that I will optimize over, okay? So, and this is what is called inductive bias. Information, prior information about the problem that you can use to select the model. So let us a little, uh, move uh, to quantum for a slide. So basically all of you have seen these kind of models where you have a quantum circuit, you have some ANSAT, which is codifying some classical data point and depends on some parameters that I will optimize. And then I have a measurement, okay? <clears throat> so now the predictor, this uh, function H that I want to look for, the, the, the optimal classifier with, will have this form, which is some expected value of these states evolved uh, using this ANSAT and then uh, I perform this, this measurement. So as well as choosing in classical machine learning the, the, the kind of neural network, the number of layers, all these kind of hyperparameters. Here, the choice of the ANSAT, the, the, the gates that I'm using, the quantum gates, the, the layers, the number of qubits is restricting my search space, okay? So if I change these unitaries, I will be changing the kind of predictors that I can, that I can access, okay? 
So this is why um, the inductive bias in, in quantum machine learning is um, the information that we know about the data and that we can encode in our model. Because maybe I know some information about the data, but I am not able to introduce this in the quantum circuit. So then I will not be able to, to take any advantage of this. So basically, uh, in general, a lot of you, all of you have seen that there are a lot of papers where they take some ANSAT by random and then they apply to some classification task and then they get some accuracy. So the idea uh, in a theoretical machine, quantum machine learning is that you will not get any advantage if you are not encoding any information about the problem uh, inside your, your model, okay? So this kind of empirical models, maybe they will work well for some classification tasks, but for getting real advantage, you need to be able to encode some inductive bias in the construction. And this is very, very important. For example, here I have two words which are quite quite relevant. This was um, presented by IBM people. I always put this example because it's one of the only uh, demonstrated uh, probable quantum advantages. And basically what they do is I want to solve the discrete logarithm problem. I know which is the structure. So I will design a quantum feature map in such a way that I, I'm taking advantage of the problem that I want to solve. And this way they find some uh, exponential separation with respect to the classical part but they have information about the problem that they want to solve because they have selected the problem beforehand just um, in an intelligent way to, to be able to show this advantage. So I have this problem, I have some information about its extract structure, and then I generate a feature map, I generate an ANSAT, which basically encodes this information, and this is how ca I can get this advantage. Other uh, information that I can encode in my quantum circuits is, for example, the symmetries. So for example, I know that if I have a picture of a cat or a picture of a cat rotated some angle, this should be the same, okay? So what I can do is if I know that my data or my classification tasks uh, contains some symmetries, I can encode these symmetries inside, inside my quantum circuit, inside my ANSAT, and this uh, model will perform better, will generalize better, or will uh, need less uh, samples to, to be trained or will get a smaller error. So this is how you are encoding information about the, the data, which are the symmetries inside the, the quantum circuit. And this is all the theory of equivariant quantum neural networks, okay? So inductive bias is a concept. Uh, selecting the model, you are restricting the family of functions that you can generate. And then once you have restricted this family, you apply the empirical risk minimization, which is minimizing some loss function and look for the optimal parameters, okay? So just to grab up here, selecting the U is restricting the search space and then optimizing over the parameters is giving you the optimal classifier, okay? But for selecting this U, it's better to have some previous knowledge about the, the problem that you have, some symmetries or some structure of the problem, okay? Yeah, now I think it's clear the inductive bias concept, which is very, very, very important in quantum machine learning research. I will introduce what is called the pack learning. And don't panic because I will explain this very, very slowly. So the training set is picked randomly, okay? Uh, as I told you before, when you select a training set, you are programming and you select a training set, there are some randomness there because you are um, picking points randomly. You are using a random seed and you are sampling from this the, the whole set and by randomness you will select this point and not this point or the inverse so the data that that, that you sample can be non-representative okay there can be some noise in your data and maybe you generate a data set and by chance you only take points which are non-representative so there's a chance that this can be so there are some randomness in this in the in this process this is why it's better formally to talk about a um, pack, which is probably approximately correct. And basically what this says is, okay, I assume that maybe the data that I'm using in my model is not representative because you have been, you have not been lucky when you are creating the data set. And I also assume that I will not be able to fit perfectly the data. So I will have some error epsilon. So basically, uh, we say that an hypothesis class H is pack learnable if 
there's a number number of samples m sub h i mean a number of a, a size of the training set and a learning algorithm with the following property which is this one here so if i consider a, a probability distribution d and a labeling labeling function f when i run the learning algorithm with more samples than the minimal number that i need i will get uh, this hypothesis which is like the, the the optimal classifier which basically will give me some error which is going to be smaller or equal than epsilon okay so this epsilon is why we are talking about approximately correct so we don't expect to get zero error so we are allowing for some error and this epsilon is how far are you from the optimal classifier how far from zero are you and the probably comes from that i know that i will get this classifier with probability at least one minus delta so the delta is the probability of getting a non-informative example so somehow I am relaxing the constraints uh, to my, my machine learning algorithm. So I'm telling, okay, uh, I assume that you will take some data set which is not very fruitful for, for the task. And I assume that you are not be able to find the perfect classifier, okay? And now this is very important for the um, quantum um, research state of the art, which is the what is the sample comp complexity. So what is the, this is telling me that there exists a finite number of training samples. And if I have more than this number of training samples, I will be able to learn or to succeed in my, in my learning task, okay? So what this means is that this uh, minimal number of samples determines the sample complexity of learning some 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 class. Okay, so it it means how many some how many examples do I need to have a probably approximately correct uh, solution? Okay, so obviously if you have access to infinite number of samples of your data, you can get zero error. Okay, but we assume that the number of samples, the the size of your training set, is a resource. And you want to keep this uh, as low as lower as possible, okay? Uh, so this is the idea. So the idea is I want to design models with some probability of success and with some error, and I want to see how many samples do I need to learn some function. So now I will talk about generalization, and I will use uh, these concepts to show you which is a little bit the state of the art of the most powerful research in theoretical quantum machine learning. And I will talk about these two papers. These two papers are two nature communications papers. This is from people from Los Alamos, uh, and this is from people from, from Berlin. And these are quite recent, 2022 and 2024. And I will try to summarize the results so you can see what, what which is the kind of uh, questions that uh, we want to answer right now in quantum machine learning. So first of all, uh, we consider uh, uh, in this first paper, generalization in quantum machine learning from fifth training data, we consider a quantum machine learning model that depends on some parameters, okay? This is a vector and I have these gate parameters, which are some rotation angles that I can optimize, but I also have some parameters that change my structure. For example, this K is a discrete number. For example, imagine that when K equal to one, I have some kind of ansat, and when k equal to two, I have another ansat. So this k can change the ansat, the structure of your quantum circuit, and this data is the parameters inside the gates. Okay, so this changes the structure of the circuit, and this the gates. So it's more general than only considering a fixed ansat and only changing the, the gate parameters. So the key quantity in this generalization study in quantum machine learning is the, the generalization error. So basically, it's the difference between the true error that we don't have access to. I mean, the true er error is the error that has a classifier over a, a learning task with unseen data points and the training error, okay? So basically, imagine that you have training error equal to zero, but you have a huge true error. This is going to be huge. So the generalization error is going to be huge if this gap is, is wide, okay? So the first theorem, of the, and this is, Believe me, this is a, a very beautiful result, is that if I consider a quantum machine learning model with T parameterized local quantum channels, to summarize T quantum gates, T unitaries, you have an ansat with T parameterized gates, 
with high probability, and this with high probability refers to this pack learning theory that I told you that you have the chance of picking a non-representative uh, training sample. So they have some guarantees of the probability of success. Over the training set of size M, this is the number of samples that you have in the training set. Um, in the in the training uh, set, so you know that that the generalization error is going to be of this order. So what you can see here, imagine that you have this this kind of ansat. So you have here you have unitaries that are parameterized, and you can also consider some fixed unitaries, global fixed unitaries. So you cannot optimize these these architectures, and then you have again another layer of parameterized unitaries and another layer of. So you can see the ansat that they are considering is quite general, no? You can have different architectures here and then you perform a measurement. And what you have here is that you have that T is the number of parameterized gates. So in this case, for example, you can see that we have six different parameterized gates. These are not parameterized gates, these are fixed gates, but we allow that there are some fixed gates in, in between. So what you can see here is that the generalization error decreases with the number of training samples which is somehow obvious, but they find how this decrease, so which is one over the square root of, of the number of, of samples, and increases with the number of parameterized gates. And the intuition be, behind this is this one. So if I increase the, the, the number of parameterized gates, I'm increasing the expressivity of my circuit, and it's more easy that I will overfit my data, okay? I will overfit my data, the training error is gonna be low, but I will not be able to generalize. This is what happens with your when your ANSAT is very expressive. So increasing the number of parameterized gates, increase the expressivity and decreases the generalization error, okay? And yeah, I mean, obviously it can seem, yeah, it's, it's, it, it makes sense that to think that this decreases with them and increases with the number of gates, but they found the, the exact dependency on, on this generalization error. And you can invert this result. We can, for example, find, uh, look for, okay, which is the number of, of training samples that I need to get a generalization error lower or equal than epsilon. And you can just isolate in, in the previous equation and the number of samples that you will need is T log of the number of parametric uh, quantum gates over uh, epsilon square. So this is the number of parametric uh, parameterized gates, this is the error, and this is the number of samples that you need to get this error. So this is giving you, if you have this ANSAT with this number of parameterized gates, you will need this order of training samples to get a good model, which is able to generalize. So this is a very, very, very powerful result in quantum machine learning theory. And this uh, was extended in two more scenarios for example, you can have a repetition of these gates. Imagine that this is the same parameterized gate. So this is a scenario in which you have uh, some copies of your uh, architecture. Imagine that each one of these parameterized gates is repeated m times. So here, for example, I have t equal to 2. I have two different parameterized quantum gates. And I have m equal to 3 because I have three repetitions of each parameterized gate. And the result is pretty much the same, but now inside the logarithm, I have this factor of M, which refers to the number of times that you uh, repeat the, the quantum gate. And for me, and this is quite uh, surprising, this other theorem, which basically now uh, you are optimizing over an ANSAT, but in the optimization pro process, you can change the architecture of the ANSAT. So maybe you start with this ANSAT, you are optimizing and you end up with this ANSAT here, which is completely different. Now I have these unitaries, I have more parameterized gates. So you are optimizing also on the architecture that you have. And basically it says that the, if you have a T parameterized gates again, and now a G different architectures, I mean, so I have a, 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 this ANSAT, uh, but I can have G different uh, ANSAT. Which I, which I could choose. And they find the dependency on the generalization error, considering that in the training, you are able to access different architectures, okay? So, and this is quite powerful because if the number of different architectures grows exponentially with the number of gates that you have, which 
may be reasonable because imagine that you have an asset with T gates, the different options that you can have, imagine that each one of these uh, T gates could be two different gates, a uh, rotation on the X axis or a rotation on the Y axis. You want to be, you want to know all the options that you can have, you will multiply two times two times two, okay? So this will be exponential in the number of, uh, the, the number of different architectures will be exponential in the number of parameterized gates that you have. And if you have this uh, exponential dependency on T, when you uh, take the logarithm of this, this, only, this is gonna only be linear in T. Okay, so this is a very powerful result. And as you can see, it's quite general. I'm not fixing an ANSAT. I'm allowing to optimize over different ANSATs, over different architectures, and I'm finding which is the generalization error that I will get when I do this kind of optimization. So to get, to believe me that to get this kind of simple expressions, they seem it's just a square root, some parameters, they are, tons of mathematical calculations, ton, tons of appendix pages. Uh, and they are so beautiful seen this way and they are so powerful, but uh, there are a lot of work behind this. And, and this, these results are, are quite important because yeah, it may be, uh, it may be obvious to, to think that this generalization error depends on the ANSAT and on the number of samples, but you need to look for, or you need to find the dependency, in, which in this way is, is of this form. And finally, I want to talk about this work, which is also very, very nice. And it's depicted, and this figure is, is from this work, but the, the figure is, is quite clear, and I will go through through the figure. So basically, what they do here is is, is a very numerical paper. I mean, it's, yeah, I encourage you to, to read this paper because it's very easy to, to understand. And they are doing some very interesting numerical uh, numerical um simulations okay so imagine that you have they have a a, a data distribution a, a learning task imagine that you have your images with your labels okay and this is the original data distribution this is my 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 set of images with the labels cats with the labels of cats and dogs with the label of labels of dogs but they also consider now i take the labels and i randomize so now i will find that what was supposed to be a cat will have a label of dog and this will be random. So I just mix the labels. So I have an original distribution and a randomized distribution, which as I'm randomizing over the, over the labels or over the inputs, uh, I will not have correlations uh, like the label with, with, the, with the data. Now it's a random task, okay? So what they do is, okay, I take the original distribution, I split in training and test set, now, using the training set, I consider an ANSAT, okay? Remember, an ANSAT is a family of functions. When I look for the optimal parameters of the ANSAT, I select the optimal function. So I have, I train over this ANSAT, which corresponds to a family of functions. When I find the optimal parameters, I'm fixing the optimal function, which is gonna be this F. And with this, I can get the training error, okay? And they are able to, to optimally train the model and they, they obtain that the training error is small. Now with the test set, what I can do is once I have my original, I, my, my optimal classifier, I use these test samples and I get the test error, which is also small, okay? Because I am considering uh, uh, the original distribution. So in general, you can have some tasks or you can have tasks that where you can find a small training error and a, and a small test error. However, if you now consider the randomized data distribution, you are able to get, again, a small training error, but now your test error is going to be large. It's going to be huge because you are randomizing the labels. Now you don't have any correlation in your data, okay? So now here, the, the generalization error of, of this model is going to be small because remember, generalization error is uh, the difference between these two values. Small minus small is going to be something small, but here, I have something large minus something small. It's gonna be it's gonna be large. Okay, so this model uh, is a usual model, and you can have a small generalization error. And this model is randomized, and you get large generalization error. So here you have the first conclusion, and this is important. So the trainability of the model. So 
how well I uh, am I able to train the model is unaffected by the absence of correlation between input and labels. Okay, here I am getting low training error, but here I am uh, obtaining low training error. So I can train a quantum machine learning model, a parameterized quantum circuit to perfectly fit data which is random with respect to the labels, okay? You can do this. But this doesn't mean that your model is good enough, as I mentioned you like in, in the very first slides. So in both cases, you get a small training error, but as you can see, you can have a large test error versus a, a, a small test error. Uh, in this sense, in the quantum machine learning literature, there are some bounds, uh, which basically is the same as before, that where you have some inequality say, uh, telling you which is the order of the generalization er error that you have. And in this paper, what, what they find basically numerically is that uh, when considering these bounds, where basically say uh, tell you, tells, uh, are telling you, okay, the generalization of this function is going to be smaller or equal than some bound. What they find is that these bounds are super high compared to the actual value. I mean, they are not very informative. It's like saying that, okay, any number, any finite number is going to be smaller than infinite. This is not providing me any, any information, despite this is a bound, no? So what it's telling me is that nowadays, the bounds that we have for these kind of architectures are very, 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 uh, very uh, unuseful, okay? Mm, you cannot rely on these bounds to get results. And this is opening a new avenue in which you really need to do some research to try to find some tighter bounds. Tighter bounds is that they are providing me uh, uh, information, useful information. So just to um, conclude and, and to make clear like the, the take home messages, which are just three. So yeah, I, I maybe I lost some of you because there are, there were some mathematical details, but I really wanted to show or to make you an idea of what is the state of the art in research in, in quantum machine learning, not only in the numerics, not only in the simulations, but in the in the analytical part. And I wanted to show you some results of the best groups in research in this field. Uh, but the take home message is, is the following. So quantum machine learning models can memorize data. So I can take random data and I can I can train a parameterized quantum circuit to perfectly fit this data, which is kind of memorizing the data. This means that if you apply this model uh, to some data which contains some noise, this will be able to learn the noise and then I will not be able to generalize. So quantum machine learning models, this could be the same as saying that are very expressive and they can fit perfectly uh, your data, okay? And this is important, are very, very expressive in this sense. The other thing is that we should care about generalization, okay? If these, pe these people are uh, making some effort on trying to, to get generalization guarantees of these models. So it's not only about being able to train a model, it's not only to uh, designing powerful ansatz. I really want to have guarantees of whether this will be able to generalize or not. And finally, uh, and this is for me the most important one, is that quantum machine learning models are not still completely understood, okay? Uh, the thing is that uh, a lot of these problems are also in the classical machine learning literature. I mean, machine learning is a heuristic field in which they firstly found that this was working without uh, understanding why. And now they are trying to look for the analytical uh, guarantees or why this should work or why this shouldn't work. And we are trying to do the same in quantum machine learning, but we are obviously restricted by what has been done in classical, in classical machine learning. So there are a lot of works which are trying to get the, some theorems from classical machine learning theory and trying to translate them into quantum circuits. What happens if instead of having a the typical neural network, now I have a quantum circuit, which is a unitary, 
what happens with the bounds, what happens with the generalization capability. And this is what we are trying to do. Um, and I really want to try to do because if not, if you don't, if you just apply models and you don't understand why, it makes no sense to, to try to build a quantum computer if you don't have any guarantee that this may work better than a, a classical one. So that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, I know that maybe this is a little bit um, theoretical, but I think it's worth it to know or to let the community know what what where is the effort now in the in the research in quantum machine learning and not only in the applications, uh, which is what we are trying to do also and the companies are trying to do, but also knowing where where is now the the, the state of the art of this of this field. And yeah, that's it for whatever some references or whatever you can send me an email and um, these papers are really really nice and very very well explained so i encourage you to to read them thank you